Today we're going to look at what I think is a pretty nice functional equation, and it's for functions on the real numbers. Also, it comes from a 2014 Serbian Math Olympiad. So our goal is to find all functions from R to R such that for all real numbers X and Y, we have F evaluated at X times F of Y minus Y times F of X is equal to F of X, Y minus X, Y. Okay, so we're going to start off in a fairly standard way, and that is to set one of our variables equal to zero and see if anything collapses. So let's do that first. So let's set y equal to zero and see what that leads us to get out of our functional equation. So we'll have f of x from here times f of zero from this f of y here minus y times f of x, but since y is zero, that'll just close this thing up right here. And then over here on the right hand side, we'll have f of zero minus zero. So we have something like this. Okay, but now let's break this into a couple of cases. And the first case will be really short. In fact, we can fit it all right here. And that'll be the case if f of zero is equal to some constant which is not equal to zero. But let's notice if we plug this into the equation which is right above, we get the following simplification. We have f of x times c, or maybe we'll write that as f of c times x, is equal to c. Okay, but now we can do a change of variables, and that change of variables will be to replace x with x over c. And notice that'll give us f of x equals c, but that's gonna be true for all real numbers x, because we're just scaling a real number by this non-zero real number. So we ended up with a constant function. But now if we sneak that constant function into our functional equation right here, we'll see a problem. So that will give us a c on the left hand side equals c minus xy on the right hand side, which tells us that x times y equals zero. But recall that now must hold for all real numbers x and y. But clearly the product of two arbitrary real numbers is not gonna be equal to zero. For instance, take x and y both to be one. So that gives us a contradiction. So we've got a contradiction there, and what did we contradict? Well, we contradicted the ability for f of zero to not be zero. So that leads us over here to our first fact, which is that f evaluated at zero is equal to zero. Okay, so that's, that's a good place to be. Now, maybe the next standard thing to do would be to evaluate this functional equation where x and y are the same. So let's do that. So now let's set x equal to y in our functional equation and see what we get. Okay, so over here on the left-hand side, we'll have f of x times f of x minus x times f of x. And that's again because x is equal to y. But over here on the right-hand side, we'll have f of x squared minus x squared. Okay, but you can probably see what's about to happen. Notice that argument of this function is equal to zero, but we just showed that f of zero is equal to zero. So that gives us the following equation. We have f evaluated at x squared equals x squared. That's because really we have f of x squared minus x squared is equal to zero, but clearly moving some things around, this is what we get. And now we're gonna do another change of variables, but this change of variables doesn't work for all values of x. It only works for non-negative values of x. So let's point that out here. So for x, which are non-negative, I'll put that on the half open interval from zero to infinity. We can make the substitution where we send x to the square root of x. In other words, we're replacing x with the square root of x. Okay, but that's gonna give us f of x equals x. So just because the square root of x squared is x. 
Okay, so now we have a partial solution. Notice that we know that f of x equals x as long as x is bigger than or equal to zero. And that really brings up the question which will lead us towards finishing this thing off. And that is, what about f of some negative numbers? Like what sort of rule might we have for that? Now here's where it gets to be a bit tricky. So let's take an arbitrary positive number. I'm gonna call it z. So it's on the interval from zero to infinity. So like I said, it's a positive number. And now since z is positive, that clearly tells us that negative z is less than zero. In other words, it's negative. So perhaps this is something we'll work with to get a handle on this question up here. What about f evaluated at negative numbers? And what we'll do is we'll take our original equation and we'll set x equal to minus z, which like I said is negative. And we'll take y and we'll set it equal to minus one. Now let's see what that gives us into our functional equation. So we'll have f of minus z times f of minus one. So that's this bit right here. And then we'll have a plus f of minus z. So that's what we get from this part right here after the minus signs cancel. And then over here on the right, we'll have f of z because minus z times minus one is z. And then this minus x times y will collapse to minus z. We've got three minus signs there. But since z is positive, f of z is z by this rule up here. So that means this right hand side cancels. So what we've done is we found something that when we plug it into our function, we get zero. And perhaps we found lots of different things that plug into our function and give us zero, because perhaps this could have infinitely many values depending on that z. But let's see what we can get from here. So now what I'll do is I'll replay this game, but now I'll set x equal to this orange underlined stuff and I'll set y equal to one. So let's do that. So like I said, x is gonna be this orange underlined stuff. I'm gonna rewrite it so it's f of minus z minus z times f of minus one. And then, like I said, we're gonna take y and set it equal to the number one. So let's see what we get out of that. So for part of this, I'm just gonna use x as x because this is just kind of lengthy. So this is gonna give us f evaluated at x times f of one, but f of one is one. And then we'll have minus, what will it be? one times f of x. So it's gonna be minus f of x. So that's what happens to this left-hand side. Okay, and then what's on this right-hand side? Well, we'll have f of x times one, so that's f of x, and then minus x when all is said and done. But now some stuff cancels very, very nicely. Notice that f of x is equal to zero by this above equation. And then this f of x is also equal to zero. Okay, but then after that, we see that all that's left inside of this outer function is a x. So that means when we evaluate it at f, we also get zero. So now putting this all together, we see that means that x is equal to zero. But of course, this isn't an arbitrary x. This is an x built out of this part right here. So now moving some things around, we'll see that in fact, f of minus z is equal to f of minus one times z. So if you plug in a negative number, you get a constant multiple of that positive number where that positive constant, or where that constant is fixed. Okay, so now I'm gonna say that this is equal to m times z with m equals f of one, and then we'll pick this back up at the top of the next board.
So far we've determined for positive values of x, f of x must be equal to x, and f of minus x must be equal to m times x. Furthermore, we saw that f of zero is equal to zero. Well, that really means that this positive values of x into this equation extends for equality, but I wanted to fill that in with this right here. But now two more compositions of carefully chosen numbers into our functional equation will finish this thing off. Okay, so let's first start with x is equal to one and y is equal to negative one and see what we get out of this. Keeping in mind that we know that f of negative one is equal to m, well, it's by this right here, but also by what we had at the end of the last board. Okay, so now plugging that into our functional equation, we'll have f evaluated at one times f of minus one, so that's m, and then we'll have minus negative one times one. So that's gonna be plus one. So that's what happens to the left-hand side. And then over here on the right-hand side, we'll have f of minus one, which is m, and then we'll have minus a negative one, which is plus one. So we have something like that. Okay, so now let's notice if m plus one is bigger than or equal to zero, then we don't really get any information out of this. So we really wanna look at the case is what happens if m plus one is strictly less than zero? Okay, but that tells us that m plus one, which is equal to f of m plus one, just by reversing this equation, can be rewritten as minus m times m plus one, based off of this equation right here. Okay, but notice if m plus one is less than zero, it's not equal to zero, but if it's not equal to zero, we can cancel it from both sides of this equation, and that leaves us with minus m equals one, which is the same thing as saying that m equals minus one. Oh, but that's a problem, because if m is equal to minus one, then we just got zero is strictly less than zero plugged into this assumption right here. So we've got, well, let's write it out. Minus one plus one is strictly less than zero, but that's a contradiction. Okay, so we contradicted this assumption right here, which means we must indeed have m plus one bigger than or equal to zero, which is the same thing as m being bigger than or equal to negative one. Okay, so we've got this inequality that m must satisfy. Okay, now we're gonna play the same game, but we'll switch the role of one and negative one here. So now let's set x equal to negative one, and we'll set y equal to positive one, and see what happens. It doesn't really seem like this should help us out, but it indeed will. Okay, so this will give us f of, so we have x, which is minus one, and then f of y, but f of one is one, so we have minus one. And then we'll have minus y, which is one, times f of minus one, which is m. So we have minus one minus m. So we have that. But then plugging it into this side, we'll have f of minus one, which is m, and then we'll have another plus one. So notice the right-hand side is symmetric with the choice of x and y. That's why we got the same right-hand side either time. Okay, now we're gonna play the same game, but I'm gonna do a little prep first. Let's maybe take this left-hand side and we'll rewrite it as f of negative m plus one, like that. Okay, but then we can say if m plus one is bigger than zero, well then that means minus m plus one is less than zero, and we can apply this rule right here. So that's gonna give us the following equation. So we'll have m plus one, which was equal to f of minus m plus one, will be equal to m times m plus one. So we have something like that.
But now if m plus one is positive, we can cancel it from both sides of this equation. This equation, which is m plus one equals m times m plus one. So that means that we have m is equal to one. Okay, so we've got a restricted value of m in this special case right here if m plus one is bigger than one. Notice we don't get any like problem and contradiction like we did before because plugging one into here is clearly okay. Okay, well, let's look at the other possibility. So we'll say otherwise, let's notice that we have m plus one is less than or equal to zero. Oh, but let's notice immediately that tells us that m is less than or equal to negative one. So now let's bring that up with our original condition up here. Well, not really our original condition, but our earlier condition right here. And notice that now we have that m must be bigger than or equal to negative one, and simultaneously m has to be less than or equal to negative one. Okay, but there's only a single number that's bigger than and less than negative one, and that's negative one itself. So that means we have m equals negative one. So these two possibilities are both valid. And I guess that requires a little bit of checking, but at that point it's fairly simple. So let's see what we've got. We have m equals one or m equals negative one. But we can actually put that together into two final solutions. And those final solutions go like this. Let's notice if m equals minus one, then we have f of minus x equals minus x. Oh, but that means that f takes a number to itself regardless of it being positive or negative, which means we can say in the end, f of x equals x for all x which are real numbers. And that's based off of this possibility for m. Of course, there's another possibility for m right here. But let's notice plugging that up here will give us f of minus x equals x when x is positive, but that's exactly the behavior of the absolute value function. And that's our other solution. Or I guess I should say at this moment, it's our other possible, possible solution. So we have f of x equals the absolute value of x for all x in real numbers. And then the very, very final thing that you would have to do would be to go through and check that indeed both of these functions work. But I'll let you guys do that as a homework exercise. I don't think it's too bad. Maybe post a sketch of your proof that both of these functions work in the comments. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.